But I do want to talk about planning. And to me, planning uh, is super important. Here's our definition that we tried to come up with last, yesterday. And again, if you don't like the word rational, um, insert meaningful, significant, reciprocal, um, whatever that, that word is that you want to do. But again, we don't think that development is about money. It's about relationships. And we believe that your ministry doesn't have a money problem. It has a relationship issue. And that we believe that based on experience, and it's not, not resource-based, but based on our experience, that those organizations that do relationships well, God honors and their monetary, volunteer, and other needs tend to be met because we're honoring relationships. But you guys know that. And again, we talked yesterday, this is just more a reminder that we talk about relationships, and that's not just financial, volunteers, advocates, board members, et cetera, et cetera. So the principles we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of the week really apply to all those different audiences, all those different categories, not just the, the financial resourcing. If you talk to somebody about their organization, they can probably tell you what their mission statement is. A lot of organizations do that. Might even be able to tell you what their vision statement is. But then we start talking about planning. And what kind of plan do you have? Well, we have plans. Well, tell me about them. Well, we like to do stuff. Well, what sorts of things you do? Well, you know, we do stuff. But there's not much of a plan in terms of what they're working off of. So based on probably 20 or 25 years worth of our consulting time that we've done with other clients, we've tried to keep track of the people that we've engaged with and their implementation of these four elements. We think these four elements are pretty crucial to having a good, solid roadmap, a plan for your organization. And for me, it's just a roadmap for relationships, right? I keep going back to the relationship work. So we know that just from the work of our clients, uh, about 98% have a mission statement. They know what it is. Some people can say it verbatim, some people can't. It's probably on a big plaque on the inside of their lobby. Uh, it's probably on their, their annual report or some of the brochures they put together, their website. There's a mission statement and they, they feel pretty good about it, hopefully. Or if they don't feel good about it, then they start to like take it off of their letterhead and take it off of their website until they have one that they like. But then we ask about vision statement, and the percentage drops pretty significantly. So they have mission, but then they can't tell you what the mission ultimately is going to accomplish because they can't figure out what the long-term vision is, or they haven't communicated it yet. So we think vision is just as important as mission. Vision is where you're going, mission is how you get there. Strategic planning, long range. In the business courses I teach, strategic plan is from three to five years and beyond. Now, anybody who did a five-year plan in 2018 or 2019 and then got right in the middle of COVID, all that plan went out the window, right? But needless to say, it's good to have a plan. But it really drops, right? 12% of the people we've worked with over the last 20 years or so have had a strategic plan as we've gone in to, to work with them. So development plan. The actual nuts and bolts of inviting people, building relationships, asking people for resources in your organization drops even more significantly. Now again, this isn't scientific, it's just things that we've come up with, we work with clients. But it's pretty consistent, I think, with things I read in business journals and nonprofit journals about where organizations are in their planning process and how they do planning. You know, we as Christians, we have funny ideas about planning. And I see two extremes. I see one extreme is, you know, we, we, we just are going to do what God wants us to do. And we're just going to go with the Spirit and kind of pray about it and kind of see what happens. And you know what? God honors that in many respects. But I also think, if you look through Scripture, there are a lot of places where God showed there was a plan. There's a plan for creation. There's a plan for bringing His people back to Him in the Old Testament. There's a plan for salvation. There's a plan for the disciples to go out two by two in the first century church. So I think there's planning. They are not incongruent. They're not opposite to put faith and planning, reliance on God, and a roadmap. They can go together. And I think they do go together. 
So that's kind of where we're headed. Let me just kind of define the terms because as I've taught in undergraduate circles, I have seen very, I've seen textbooks share vision and mission two different ways. So vision is really how you think the world should be. It's not the world in its current state. It's what will happen if you as an organization can do everything that you need to achieve to do through your mission. Okay, so it's a longer term view. Lead with your vision, not with your need. We talked about yesterday. The mission is your organization's part of that. Okay, so a vision for your ministry might be, we wanna see the entire world evangelized. Your part of that might be, we wanna see young children evangelized in our country because you have a certain scope for your organization. Certain might be geographic, might be age related, might be connected some other way, but there's a smaller scope of that. But you're building toward that bigger vision that you believe you're part of. So one's longer term, one is more day to day and what we're doing missionally day to day. And then planning is just the process of forgetting there. And we're gonna see in a couple of slides later, we're gonna talk about this roadmap for relationships that really gets us kind of a path that we can then begin to follow. Not only do we follow it, but our board begins to follow it. And the volunteers know what that roadmap is. And our donors know what that roadmap is. So anybody talking about our plan can kind of realize, yeah, we're on the right course, we're moving at the right speed, we're going that direction, or something's happened, COVID, we have to make changes and adjustments and alterations to the plan. So those are kind of the definitions I'm using as a thing about vision, mission, and planning, okay? okay. So Andy Stanley is a pretty well-known um, church pastor and author in the United States, and I love his definition of vision. He's, he's done a couple books on vision, and I love this one. A clear mental picture of what could be fueled by the conviction that it should be. So it's not just, oh, don't we wish that the world was a better place to live? Oh, don't we wish there's a better place for kids to play? Don't we wish there's a better place for, for people to come learn about Jesus? Because we always say that. But it's the conviction behind that vision that drives an individual, that drives an organization to accomplish that and pursue that vision. Okay? So it's not the current state. It's in the future. It's what could be if we have the conviction and dedication to pursue it and go after it. We like to use the term vision equals mission accomplished. So if we do everything that we can within our mission on a day-to-day -day basis, month after month, year after year, at some point we believe that the vision for our organization will be fulfilled. That make sense? Yeah. Okay, all right. Let me give a couple of examples. People ask me, what's the difference between vision and mission? Here are some real life examples from organizations that we've had relationships with in the past. Habitat for Humanity. Now they've changed their, their vision statement a couple of times over the years. And you probably won't change your vision statement very often, but they've been around for a long time. So here's their vision statement for Habitat. A world where everyone has a decent place to live. North America, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, doesn't matter the context because within that context, we can all imagine what a decent place to live might be, okay? So that's their goal, that's their vision. That's their ultimate dream. It's not the current state, their ultimate dream, a decent place for everybody to live, okay? Heartbeat International, we've done a lot of work with Heartbeat organizations over the years. Their international headquarters is less than a mile from, from where I live. We have great relationships with them. Here's theirs, to make abortion unwanted today and unthinkable for future generations. So kind of twofold. We don't want it to happen now. We don't even people be able to consider it in the future. So that's their vision, not the current state, right? So that's the vision, longer term, casting vision. We're, what do we see could happen if we're to join God in his promises? Same two organizations, here's their mission statement for the same two, Habitat. Seeking to put God's love into action, Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. 
a world where everyone has a decent place to live, broad, compelling, future thinking, here's how we do it. We build homes. We build communities. We build hope. Heartbeat, similar, to reach and rescue as many lives as possible around the world through an effective network of life-affirming pregnancy help to help renew communities for life. More of a mouthful, perhaps. Still fits their vision, right? Just worded differently. One thing that we like organizations to do, that we encourage organizations to do, if you look at this mission, these mission statements, you see a number of commas, number of phrases. Habitat, people together to build homes, comma, communities, could be a comma there, and hope. Heartbeat, uh, as many lives as possible, comma, around the world, comma, through an effective network, comma. We like those phrases to be measurable. That helps all of us remember and understand what we're about. It's how we know that we're staying on track. So Habitat, on a quarterly basis, every annual basis, monthly basis, can go back and say, are we building homes? Are we building communities? Are we building hope? How do we do that? Heartbeat, same way. Now they could probably, a couple of things about heartbeats is I find interesting, they could probably do reach, rescue, and renew, which I have those bolded, that's my emphasis, not theirs. So they could think about reaching more people, they could talk about rescuing how many young women have actually made a decision to keep their child, and then renew the community into one that is accepting of pro-life, more engaged in pro-life, more supportive of that situation. But they also have those commas. So one thing I'll ask you to do later on in this hour is to go through your current mission statement and kind of think through, do we have those sorts of clauses? Do we have those sorts of commas? And are they measurable? Can we share that with somebody and say, you know, in our annual report, in our regular newsletters, can we show progress in terms of achieving our mission, fulfilling our mission, that again leads to the fulfillment of our, of our vision? Let's talk about planning for a minute, because I, when I first started consulting, I worked with a lot of organizations that had just spent a lot of time, energy, and resources building a strategic plan. And somehow God led me to three or four of those organizations. They just finished their big plan. The board had decided on it. They voted on it. They could put it into place. And I was asked to come in and work with the staff to help them implement that. Now, first piece of news was the staff wasn't involved in helping build a plan. That's not always a good thing. And the staff was like, well, gosh, I've already got 40 hours work of, worth of work in my life. I already work in 50 hours a week or 60 hours a week. And now the board wants me to do more? What am I going to do? And they were just kind of beside themselves. So I helped them kind of implement the strategic plan into an operational plan. And that was kind of the first three or four clients that I, that I had. What had happened in every case almost is that the board had made this great big huge uh, commitment to develop a strategic plan and they put it in a big beautiful published three ring binder and it went up on the shelf and it was never implemented. So I've over the years I've gotten away from the term strategic plan to strategic planning to do the ING because it's always going to be evolving it's always going to be changing. I had a number of clients in 2008, 2009, when the whole economic contraction happened really around the world, starting in the United States, sorry, but kind of ripple effect around the world. All these organizations that had all these budgets, all these plans set at a certain giving level, and then some of their donors realized that they were struggling financially and couldn't give as much, and couldn't give as much, and couldn't give as much. And they found themselves with a wonderfully crafted plan, but with no resources to implement it. So I've gone to the, to the term planning instead of plan, because it's going to be evolving all the time. This might be another shameful plug. I did write a book on the story of Nehemiah. It's not a fundraising book, it's a leadership book. It's one of those things where um, when I was 17 and kind of getting my faith walk back on track, had an adult who was investing in me and mentoring me, discipling me, I was exposed to the book of Nehemiah for the first time. And from that summer, as I read the book for the first time, I really had this 
the sense that I was supposed to do something with the book of Nehemiah. Had no idea what that was. Now, this is a long time ago. <laughs> I was 17. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. But as that kind of continued to grow in me, it turned into some very cool things that God did that I was supposed to write a book. So I did. It was more about out of obedience than anything else. And I got a couple of copies in my room I can bring in if people are interested. Um, but Nehemiah, I think, is a great example, as I think it is, between vision, mission, and this idea of planning and strategic planning. And we'll talk about that in a little bit later. So let's look at the model that we use for strategic planning and development planning. It's a pyramid. It's really simple. Okay? Pyramid is a very strong architectural structure. It's very solid. It's very stable. At the top of the pyramid is your vision for your organization. Again, long term, what's in the future, what can we accomplish if we walk together. The base of the pyramid is your mission statement, hopefully with measurable clauses. Okay? On one side of the pyramid is your strategic planning. Three to five years out, although I've been reading articles now that say maybe two to three might be better because of things that have happened recently, right? So don't go quite so far out. And then development planning, as we call it, fundraising planning if you want to, is the other side of that pyramid. Now, the thing about the pyramid is, as long as those sides are equal, it's a very solid structure, right? Carry all sorts of weight, can last for a long, long time if you've been to the pyramids in Egypt. But what happens if one of those gets a little bit smaller or smaller? It falls over, right? It becomes instable. Unstable? Unstable. And it's not going to work anymore. So we want to see the strategic planning and the development planning working hand in hand along the same path. What that might look like is and I've just randomly broken this into one-year goals across a five-year longer plan. And for instance, every quarter in the board meeting or every six months or every month, depends on how often your board members meet, uh, kind of how much activity you have going on, what time of year it might be for your organizations. Many organizations have kind of this really busy season and some don't. So you might want to not focus on this during the busy season because we're all really being busy but you might want to focus on it other times during the year and really think through what are the measurable goals and objectives moving forward? What's the timeline for those goals? Who's responsible for those goals? How will we know when those goals are accomplished and achieved? Not just on the strategic planning side, but on the development planning side as well. So again, those have to work in lockstep. Because if the board and the leadership are moving down the road in the strategic plan, but you don't have the resources to back it up, guess what? Your pyramid is going to collapse. So what tends to happen in real life, in my experience, is the board is moving full speed ahead, and the staff are going, we don't have that kind of money raised yet. How are we going to do this? We don't have enough volunteers. What was the board thinking? So I want those in lockstep. Now, it all sounds wonderful on paper. It all looks very symmetrical in a PowerPoint. Life isn't always symmetrical, right? This is how we want our mission and vision to connect, right? I like to hike. I like to camp. My wife and I do a lot of hiking and, and that sort of thing. So either down in this lower right corner, you have the GPS that's in your car, either built into the dash or on your phone. Uh, up in the, the left-hand corner is a mobile GPS unit that hikers and backpackers use, outdoor people use, to kind of get the satellite signal and know where you're going. I also carry a real-life compass with me, just in case. But you really want to have this wonderful, smooth, straight line between your mission, your mission and your vision, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I think a lot of times it looks like this. The vision is the destination. If you're getting your car and you plugged in Paris, you know your destination is Paris. As you start to go, the computer in your car says, construction up ahead, there's a detour, or there's an accident, or there's a road closure. So it's not gonna be the straight line that you thought it was going to be. 
if you had a strategic plan built in 2018 or 2019, you had a really interesting path. We well, probably all did as we went through COVID, right? So it's never gonna look the way that you want it to look on paper. The plan is always going to change. The destination will not, the vision will not, but the plan and how you get there will change based on circumstances inside the organization, based on situations outside the organization. All that's gonna to come together. And what I find most organizations struggle with is the tension between what we think the plan is supposed to be versus what the plan really needs to be because of changes, maybe not of our design. So organizations really have to get comfortable with that flexibility and that I call it a tension between this is the destination, are we still on the way to the destination even though we have this detour or this shortcut or we had car problems and had to slow down a little bit or we ran out of petrol so we had to stop and find some petrol so we could refuel. Petrol being what? Financial resources perhaps. So, so that's how this kind of fits together for me. Here's a way to perhaps get it started for you. I love it, I've taught business for a long, long time, and I've actually had uh, business uh, graduate and undergraduate level courses, textbooks that say, there is no one single way to do strategic planning. And right away, people get nervous because they're looking for a plan, they're looking for a, a model. So here's one way you might want to consider that. It's a way that's worked pretty well. So you have a planning team. We call them task force. We don't like committees, don't like the term committee. Um, I've been on church committees that I'm not even sure how I got there, and I don't know how to get off. But, so I'm on a committee, call it task force, call it a work group, whatever kind of term you want to use. It's not gonna be a long-term standing deal. It's gonna meet for a few months. It's gonna meet for a few times to kind of get things going. Now, on that planning team, I would love to have as many board members as possible. I want to have as many senior staff as possible. I want to have two or three pretty faithful donors as part of that team. To really talk through vision, to talk through mission. Where are we headed? What are we struggling with? Where do we think the most help needs to be applied in terms of our mission and our vision? How much might that cost us? And then what they can begin to do is break out the mission statement and what we call mission critical areas or important areas that you need to work on as an organization. And then you have smaller groups work on that. So you have subsets of the planning team begin to work on the clauses. That's the mission statement, one, two, three, four, three to four clauses in your mission statement. And then mission critical areas that are important right now. Now you may have 20 important areas the organization needs to work on. But you can't do 20 at one time. So you'll have to prioritize what's the most important thing to do next. Let me give a couple examples of that. Here's just a sample. Again, we do a lot of work with pregnancy care centers. They have a task force. I've stolen from Heartbeat's mission to reach, rescue, and renew. So we'd have a small group, two, three, four people, work on those clauses. What does that mean? Can they be measurable? What would that look like for us? And then mission critical areas, staff, always important because it's a high attention to detail, high personal relationship sort of activity. Many have medical facilities. So they have nurses on staff, might have medical director. What does that look like? Volunteers, big, big mission critical element for all of us. We'll never have all the money that we want to pay for everything that we want to buy. We got to have volunteers involved in helping us do what we need to get done. They have outreach to churches, so that's a big issue for them, important issue for them. And then public policy, at least in the United States, a lot of public policy issues, legislative action, talking to, council, uh, to le re legislative representatives, that sort of thing. So that's just a kind of a, a sample. If I were to work with the Pregnancy Care Center, this is how I'd walk in with thinking, how do we do this planning together? Okay, that's one example, hold that thought. Three to five years, start with two to three. If that feels a little better, a little more manageable, a little more bite-sized. It's messy. Need to be able to have some pretty honest conversations about where we're headed and where we are right now. And it will change. Your roadmap will change. 
It is, it is going to happen. <laughs> we all just lived through it. Because everything that we planned in 2019 or 2018 went out the window and we had to adjust, pivot, flex, whatever term you want to use to make sure that we could still maintain our mission and reach to the people that God wants us to reach. Let me give you just a couple of examples. That's one you can use, kind of the template. This was for a, a school, a Christian school, a Christian academy. Mission statement was to teach, prepare, and empower. Those are the clauses in their mission statement. They looked at staff, looked at buildings, looked at curriculum, but they're actually teaching the classroom. Looked at extracurricular. Sports could be part of that. And that's just, again, they may not be able to do all five of these in the same time frame. The, the Christian school that's attached to my church worked on two or three of these, but it took them three or four years to get there, to get those major, what we call critical mission, mission critical areas, to be satis kind of satisfied and, and dealt with. There may be one that's more urgent than others, and then great, work on that one first. Here's one, child evangelism. Again, just a sample for you to think about. Train, promote, and inspire was part of the mission statement. A lot of volunteers, they need resources, right? Print, video, audio, whatever the kids need to learn about Jesus in that child evangelism process. Different programs. How do they get that word out to churches? That was another big piece for them. So again, you're going to have to think through for your own ministry, what are those two or three or four bigger mission critical areas and how are they connected to your mission statement? And this is just really kind of give you a sample of what you might be able to do with your things as well. But here's, here's my example. I probably should have had this up earlier. How I view Nehemiah in strategic planning um, and how I talk about it. Because I, I really love the way that Nehemiah has kind of written for us through his narrative. For me, the whole idea of vision and mission and planning. So Nehemiah, got to love him, probably never been to Jerusalem in his life but he hears of the story of what's going on, if you're familiar with it, and, he, and God just gives him a heart. He didn't give Nehemiah a heart to go back and build a wall. He gave him a heart to bring God's people back together in the city that he had called them to. So his vision was not to go be a construction manager. His vision was to bring God's people back together. But the mission in the story became the need to build a wall so people would be safe, protected, and be secure when they come back together from the disbursement and from being from the captivity. But here's how the, the plan changed for him. So he kind of set his vision. He revealed the vision to the king. The king was the last person on the face of the planet who was going to benefit by God's people coming back together because he knew history. He knew if God's people came back together, they were a strong and mighty nation, and he would probably be wiped out. But he, he approved it, God allowed him to approve it, and they moved on. Nehemiah came back, he made the announcement, got people rallied together, they were really excited. Then all of a sudden the opposition started. First externally, and then internally. So almost every single chapter, Nehemiah's roadmap changed. His plan changed because of what was going on. Again, he wasn't there to, well, he was there to build a wall. He was there to bring God's people back together. That was the vision. So the destination in his mind never changed, but the way to get there changed almost every single chapter through the first three or four. So it's just, I, I love to use that one as an example. I think there are other examples of planning in the scriptures as well. I want to give just a quick word of encouragement. Um, this has been a crash course in planning and vision and mission. If we were to go in with a client of ours and do this, it would probably happen over three to six months. We start with a board retreat that would probably last anywhere from six to 12 hours during the course of a weekend, like a Friday night, all day Saturday sort of a thing. Bring all those key players together, key stakeholders, volunteers, et cetera, and then set them apart in their action teams to go do the rest of that work with continual check-ins. So you've done about six months work of work, worth of work in less than an hour. So give yourself some grace, give yourself some, some leeway as you go back to start to work people in organization. But again, as I mentioned earlier, planning, this whole process of planning is a group thing. It can't be done by one individual. 
So you'll need to go back to the people in your organization, your board, your executive leadership, your volunteers, and try to figure out what of this still applies. Your vision and mission statement might be spot on. That may not work at any work at all. But there might be other pieces of this model that might be helpful for you to kind of get involved in and, and for your group to get involved in. So give yourself some grace, some patience, some leeway on that. But the model is here, the worksheets are here, kind of everything you need to kind of go back and begin to do this with your own organization and your own ministry.